right, good morning, welcome. Nice to see you here on this beautiful July morning that we have. A nice uh, warm day, a great day. Again, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, for sure. So welcome, welcome to those who are here. Uh, welcome to those who are watching online. So we are looking forward to a good morning. So whether you're watching us through our website or Facebook or our YouTube channel, again, welcome. I want to mention just a couple of announcements here at the beginning. Uh, you can look, if you got a bulletin, you can look in there. But just want to mention again, this Wednesday at 1.30 will be our Bible study and prayer time at the church. And then I see on Thursday is the ladies' a Zoom Bible study. That's this Thursday at 6. Uh, also be uh, uh, praying for our, as we're working on that preparation, the details for our, our big uh, freedom uh, celebration, August 13th. That's going to be a big day, a big event. So keep praying for that and all the details that, to come together for that. And then also we're looking forward to having a, at the latter, we haven't picked a date yet. We'll work it out with those who, a baptism event. And so uh, probably the latter part, one of the last two Sundays in August. So if there's someone here who would like to be part of that, if you have not been baptized, would like to be, uh, please come see me. And we'll uh, talk about that. All right. I think that's all I'll mention. The other things you can read in there. But we have this verse, Psalm 63. It says, Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Indeed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much that we can gather here this morning and give you praise and thanks. And, and uh, with may our hearts be filled with gratitude for your blessings. And we are very... Uh, thankful for how you're at work in our lives, in our world, and we give you thanks and praise for all of this. So Lord, open our hearts and minds that we might bless you this morning from sincere hearts as we seek to worship you in spirit and in truth. For it's in your strong name we pray. Amen. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Please stand as we begin our worship. Yeah. 
Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white. Thank you. Appreciate the singing. I'd like to read for a scripture reading this morning from Psalm 147. Psalm 147. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there, or else if you um, should be a Bible in a pew, a chair in front of you, and it should be on the screen as well. 
uh, behind us here. Psalm 147. It says, Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars. He gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the humble. He casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of a man, but the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. He makes peace in your borders. He fills you with the finest of the wheat. He sends out his command to the earth. His word runs swiftly. He gives snow like wool. He scatters frost like ashes. He hurls down his crystals of ice like crumbs. Who can stand before his cold? He sends out his word and melts them. He makes his wind blow and the waters flow. He declares his word to Jacob, his statutes and rules to Israel. He has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know his rules. Praise the Lord. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for this good day. Again, this is a day you've made, and Lord, Lord, what a great day it is. We give you thanks and praise. And thank you for what a great and awesome God you are, mighty in power, perfect in wisdom. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins so that now all who, all who love you, all who place their trust, their hope in you, can experience forgiveness of sins, can experience fresh starts in life, can experience the hope that you alone can give and the great hope and assurance of eternal life. Lord, who else can do that? Nobody else, no other thing, philosophy or person can do that. But you did that. And so we are reminded of that and we give you thanks and praise. And thank you so much for the blessings you do give us, uh, many of which we're completely unaware of. And times when you've protected us and helped us along or strengthened us. And so we thank you for your grace, your ever-present grace moment by moment that we're so dependent on. So Lord, our, our eyes are upon you. Lead us, guide us, strengthen us by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you'd be with all the preparations and details for the freedom celebration, that that'd be a great day of not only honoring you, but honoring our veterans and first responders. And, and I pray for our vacation Bible school coming up, that you would provide for all the needs there and for teachers and helpers and Pray for the kids that they might learn more about you and learn to love you more and trust you. And, and so, Lord, we give you thanks. I pray for those two who are ill, some are, are sick. I pray that you might raise them back up to their health soon. We pray for those who are traveling on vacations and various places, be with them, and may they return home safely. So, Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all these things. For you are worthy of all this and help us to walk in a manner worthy of your kingdom. To, Please you in every respect, bearing fruit in every good way, as we just sang about. The fields are white under harvest. There are so many who are willing to and eager to respond. Lord, help us to be eager to share the good news, because indeed it is uh, very good news, the best of news. And we give you thanks for all this. In Jesus' name, amen.
seal oh, the bliss of this glorious thought my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more praise the Lord praise the Lord oh my soul it is well it is well with my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul and Lord is the day when thy faith shall be signed the clouds be rolled back as a scroll the trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend even so it is well with my soul it is well All right, good morning, good to see you. Again, on this good day. Are you prepared to try to stay cool for the next couple of weeks? And that's all right, we, uh, we know what's coming later this year, so, you know, as the days are getting shorter and, you know. All right, so it, there's uh, some message notes in your bulletin. Feel free if you want to take that out. Uh, look at that, follow along on there, that'd be fine. As we have just started this series on the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll be here for a little while, this greatest of all messages, the Sermon on the Mount, these words of Jesus. So today we're looking actually at the first beatitude Last week we kind of gave an overview of the message itself, I mean in terms of its importance and uh, why we should study this. Uh, so I've entitled this, eight, this for this next little section anyway, Eight Ingredients for Authentic Happiness, and the first one being poor in spirit. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your scriptures, for your word, that your word is settled forever in heaven, that you have preserved it all these years so that we can study it and know it, and, uh, and obey it, and to share it with others, because uh, again, it is good news. And so I pray that you'd bless our time, help me as I speak, that I might uh, portray accurately your scriptures, that you would help us by your Holy Spirit to apply this, and, uh, and to live it out in a way that honors you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, what uh, we could maybe ask this, uh, what is your view of God? How do you view God? Uh, probably one of the most important things about us. Uh, do you see him as a, uh, as has been said elsewhere, do you see him like as a cosmic killjoy? You know, do you see him as a harsh and stern heavenly policeman? Uh, do you see him as a, a, as a old, tired grandpa sitting up there, you know, with the long beard? Do you, uh, 
uh, see him as a meek and mild, pale Galilean who would not hurt a flea? Uh, you know, what's, what's your view of God? And as we'll see from the beginning of uh, this message, as we look at it, uh, at this probably the most famous and most countercultural message ever given, uh, we'll see that God is not like any of those uh, caricatures. He's not a cosmic killjoy, for example. He's not uh, sitting up there in heaven, you know, looking down and seeing, you know, are you having fun there? Cut it out. He's not doing that. Rather, uh, he loves you. And uh, he wants you to know him. He wants you to get to know him, who is life itself. And he wants to give you the desire and the power to, uh, to know what's best and to do what's best. Uh, he wants you to be truly happy. I mean, that's what we see, you know, the New Testament, the good news begins with this whole series of, uh, you know, keys, uh, this repeated theme of happiness, where it's, you know, blessed are those, blessed, blessed. Uh, so we want to take a look at that. Now, let me give first just kind of a few uh, reminders, perhaps, about these uh, great character uh, qualities we'll see here. For example, and, and you probably know this, but you know the word blessed, just, uh, you know, you don't need to know this, but you know the Greek word is makarios. It means, it, it can be translated happy, fortunate, blissful, uh, amongst other things. You know, often we still use just the word bless or to be blessed because we really don't have a word in English that really explains fully what that word means. Uh, parts of it and aspects of it, but it's a very rich word, so we end up just using the word blessed uh, because that's what we mean by it. But, you know, it, and being blessed is more than just happiness. It includes happiness, but it's more than just a temporary feeling, I'm happy because that's usually dependent on our circumstances, but blessed is, is more of a, something more permanent, just more of a, of a state or a condition of being blessed. Uh, um, and it's not so dependent on your circumstances. Uh, it also carries the idea that one is approved by God, approved unto God. I like that, the uh, uh, AUG, the degree AUG, approved unto God. There's a degree to seek for. Better than any college degree is the degree AUG, uh, because that has not only good things now, but for eternity as well. That's the degree we want, approved unto God. But the idea of being blessed carries that idea that we are uh, approved by God. And, and in fact, the Bible uses this word too, blessed, to describe God himself. He is blessed, and we are to uh, bless him. And so. Uh, the idea, again, being blessed comes from, since he is blessed, anyone who has a personal relationship with God is blessed as well. So, you know, it's a tough one to nail down for sure. You know, we have to give this multiple definitions to try to get the idea of it. It's such a rich word, kind of like the word shalom. It's such a rich word. Uh, but to be blessed is not something it's not a superficial feeling, it's a supernatural uh, experience. And we really do live, we keep forgetting that, in a supernatural world. We are in a spiritual battle, and we must not forget that. But it's, this, it's more of a, of a divine experience of contentedness, you could maybe put it that way, of knowing that your life is right with God through faith. All right. Um, you know, also, it's kind of interesting, these beatitudes as we call them. Uh, and you know, there are other beatitudes scattered throughout the scriptures, but throughout the New Testament. In fact, that would make an interesting study to do is go and find all the beatitudes in the New Testament. For example, there's I know one later in Matthew. Uh, I think there's like seven in the book of Revelation. So these aren't the only beatitudes that Jesus gave us. There are more. So again, that would be, I think, a good study. But anyway, one of the things is that each of these Beatitudes is like a paradox. And what I mean by that is that it, it gives a condition and a blessing. And the blessing doesn't usually seem to, at least to us, follow the, the condition. Uh, for example, let's just read these first uh, opening ones here. Matthew 5, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, we talked about that last week, uh, teachers back then did that, that his disciples came to him. And there are crowds all around, it says. 
And he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then the next one, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And we think he's talking about being blessed, you know, being fortunate, being happy, you know, contented in a sense. And so we look at the condition and then the blessing, they don't often seem to match because we don't usually think of humility and mourning as being something that would make you happy. It doesn't, you know, seem to go along, uh, uh, you know, that that would be a blessing when you have that. Or you wouldn't usually think of, you know, mourning as one of the ingredients for a happy life. So that's where, again, kind of this whole idea of a paradox. You know, because again, we're so used to what, you know, our culture says, you know, the, our culture says you're happy if you're rich, you know, you're happy if you're famous, you're happy, you know, if you're successful, you know, if you're happy if you're, you know, you can list all kinds of things that go after that. But just as Jesus' kingdom, like he said to Pilate, my kingdom's not of this world, his ways are not of this world either. So that really shouldn't surprise us. Uh, so. And neither is his way to authentic happiness. Okay? All right. And what he's describing here in these Beatitudes and this whole sermon is, I mean, it's a whole new way to live. That's why it's so countercultural to what our society says. Uh, and it's life on a higher plane. It's a living a life uh, uh, of selflessness. You know, in total contrast to our natural desires and what we see all around us of, you know, selfishness. Is, it counteracts that. And one of the things it does, it reminds us that we can't live this way on our own. We don't have the, uh, the power to do it. It's just not in us. We can't live uh, like all the things he's going to talk about in our own strength. Um, it shows we, uh, it, you know, there might be times when we might, uh, you know, with the proper training, you might do something good, or there might have certain spurts where we do good, but it's not, it doesn't become second nature to us like, like it was for Jesus. He, he just responded this way. And, and that shows we too, we need to have his nature. We need a new nature. It's kind of like, say if you're, uh, let's say you were a lion trainer and you uh, had this lion in the cage and you, uh, you are training him and you're lecturing him every day that the world would be a lot better if the lions would learn just to live peaceably with the lambs. That would be nice. And so you've lectured him for weeks now, and you, uh, okay, it's time to test it, and you put a nice little lamb in his cage. What's gonna happen? Well, we all know what's gonna happen, you know. Uh, because even with all your lecturing, uh, his nature has not changed and the lion just happens to love mutton. And so you know what's gonna happen there. It's kind of like uh, uh, some years back, our daughter Laura uh, uh, told us a story when she was, uh, she's a, a nurse now, so a human nurse before she was an animal nurse, she was a vet tech. And uh, so every day she's involved with cats and dogs, involved in all kinds of surgeries and, and dogs would eat the weirdest things and they'd have to get that out. And, and uh, she said labs are always the worst, they ate everything. And, uh, but um, she said one day they had a, a day, they called it a control day. And what it was is they would uh, practice learning to control uh, scared dogs. Because lots of times dogs would come in, you know, the vet, and they'd be anxious and scared. And, and if you're not careful, you know, they might bite you. And so they had to learn to, you know, control these animals. And she said it really didn't seem fair to her because uh, the other vet techs, they all got a little Pomeranian, just, you know, a little dog. She was the only one, and she got a big Rottweiler. And, she, you know, what's up with that? And, and the dog was, you know, was big and strong and scared. And so she said, I had to put a muzzle on this dog. You know, so he went and bite. And, uh, and she said, you know what he did? You know, I said, well, what? He just snapped the muzzle. He was so strong. And so even in that case, you know, his nature, but also in that case, some of his nurture, you know, had not changed. And so the results were pretty predictable. But same thing, this idea of, again, of needing a new nature. That's one of the things these Beatitudes in the sermon reveals to us. We need his help to do that. 
Uh, maybe one more thing in general about these Beatitudes before we start looking at them in uh, specific, uh, is that I, I believe that these Beatitudes are progressive, okay? I don't think these, are the, these eight Beatitudes are just given in a random, haphazard manner. I mean, does Jesus ever do anything in a haphazard way? Sometimes it appears to us that it seems that way, but no. He always has a plan. He always has the wisest plan. He has the best plan. Even if we might not agree at the time, his plan is always the wisest. And we may not, we might get glimpses why it is. Sometimes we may not have any idea why it is, but that's why you need to constantly get to know God better so we can trust him and know that his plan is best. But he doesn't do things in a haphazard way, just like he's not in your life. He's not, whatever he's at work and, you know, doing in your life, it's not being done in a haphazard way. You can be assured of that. Just like in the world too. Man, it looks like everything's chaotic and out of control. Uh, no, God's prophetic timetable is unfolding right on schedule, exactly as he said it would. He doesn't do things in a haphazard way, uh, even though it totally might appear that way to us, uh, but not to him, not from his perspective. So, so I don't, I, these I think are progressive. And what I mean by that is that each one leads to the next one. There's kind of a logical succession here. Uh, it's kind of like climbing a ladder. And so the poor in spirit being the first one is the bottom rung. And then you, you know, build up from there. Okay. And uh, maybe I could say this, a believer who demonstrates these characteristics, these quality characteristics, will also experience that last beatitude. You know, what is that one? Notice what it says in verse 10. Blessed are those who are, yikes, persecuted for righteousness sake. Not being persecuted if you do something dumb. Eh, you deserve that. But for righteousness sake. Um, and so, and why is that? And I, you know, persecution of some kind. Uh, I, I, I think because your life will be, if you're, you know, displaying these characteristics, will be so different um, from the way the world acts, that uh, these beatitudes and their, these qualities will, uh, in a sense, rebuke them for uh, this way of living. Uh, with that, I, I think of the uh, story, I've, I've shared this before, a uh, story of uh, Billy Graham, and he was out, uh, some guys invited him to play golf, and he was part of a foursome. And uh, so he, uh, you know, played, and uh, when they got done, one of the uh, friends of one of the guys who played with Billy Graham said, how oh, was it, you know, how, what was it like playing with Billy Graham? And he said, oh man, he was rough on me. You know, I was so convicted. And the guy said, really, he was tough on you, huh? What did he say? Oh, he, he didn't talk to me at all about religion. And, you know, do you see what, you know, what was going on there? Billy Graham, the great evangelist, didn't even try to share his faith with this guy out on the golf course, but the guy just being in Billy's presence was so convicted. Uh, <clears throat> that's kind of what, you know, you live these kinds of qualities out, that's kind of what it does, it can do. And so, yes, uh, when, you start, um, when you start seeing these kinds of tremendous qualities in your life, uh, you know, you start having the character of Jesus, some people will love it. And they'll love that, and other people will despise it, just like they did him. And, and, and told, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, as they brought him down, you know, they seek to tear you down, usually through lies and slander. I mean, that's how they got him crucified. They lied about him, slandered him. That's always been the world's, you know, method of operating, lies and slander. They, yeah. All right. I've, uh, if you're following along on the sheet, I'm at point two. Uh, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? So let's look at this first one, verse three. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Do you realize how easy it'd be to memorize that? In fact, let's do that. Uh, take that one. You probably have it memorized already. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let's all seek to memorize that, and then each week we'll learn the next one. So that when we're done with all eight, You'll be able to give all eight, okay? So that's your assignment, one assignment for this week. Uh, memorize that verse. I mean, it's so short, you probably already have it memorized. And some say, well, I'm no good. I'm old, I don't remember things anymore. Uh, I don't believe that um, because we memorize all sorts of things constantly. It might take a little more work, but you can do this. Uh, all right. 
So the, the idea here, poor in spirit, uh, the word poor in Greek is patokos. It just means um, uh, to be, um, I think I put it on the sheet, to shrink, uh, to cower, to, to cringe. Uh, uh, it's like beggars would do. Uh, they would, you know, uh, you know, it's used to someone who's kind of crouching uh, and begging. But the idea is that they're not just in poverty, they are penniless. I mean, they're not just poor, they have nothing, and so they're totally dependent on others to provide for them. And so Jesus takes that idea, you know, we go, well, I don't like that idea of cringing, you know, I don't wanna do that. But he takes that idea and he applies it to being our spiritual poverty. <clears throat> and then it, be, it presents, I think, a great picture. Uh, um, and, and let me say too, Matthew, both here and throughout the, uh, his gospel, uh, always he makes it clear that he's referring to um, the condition of the heart, uh, the condition of our spirit, not of our wallet, okay? He's not talking about your wallet, the condition of that. As it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So uh, to be poor in spirit is someone who <coughs> recognizes <coughs> Uh, their spiritual poverty apart from God. There's the key phrase, apart from God. Uh, is to see oneself as one really is apart from Christ. Spiritually lost, uh, lost, helpless, without eternal hope, uh, regardless of how much money you might have in the bank, regardless of uh, um, how much stuff you might have or education or any of that success. Apart from Jesus, each person Every person on the planet is spiritually bankrupt. All right. And the poor in spirit understand that and willingly grasp, embrace that. The proud in spirit will not embrace that. They don't accept that. Uh, when one is feeling helpless and one is feeling uh, hopeless, uh, it's hard to see how this could be a good thing. Uh, and yet Jesus says, this is a good thing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus, and so he's giving God's opinion here, not man's opinion. God's opinion is, you know, this, uh, this poor in spirit, you sense that, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, and that's the first step in these, uh, this series of Beatitudes. So, uh, I mean, think of it. He, he says that quali the, the, the blessing then is, it qualifies you for the kingdom of heaven. And so the opposite's also true. If you lose this, this poor in spirit, it disqualifies you from heaven. Wow. Okay. And in one sense, another way that it's, what it's saying is that we need the Lord always, always we need the Lord. Um, it's just that many don't understand that or don't want to accept that. In their pride, they like to think that, you know, surely I've done something good. Oh yeah, sure, Jesus, you did all this. Maybe you did 99% of it, but I did a little bit, my 1%, that's good. And, and then you have pride in that 1%. No. Um, or it might be someone might say, God, look what I've done for you. Look what I can do for you with my ability, my skills and my money. And it basically, God will ignore that. Um, the poor in spirit understands that we stand empty handed before God. You know, nothing in my hands I cling, you know, or do I bring. You know, we, we cling to the cross of Christ, as the song says. Uh, and, and the idea of poor in spirit also has, carries that idea that it's authentic, okay? It's real, it's genuine. Um, it's not, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to brag, but I'm really proud of my humility. You know, no, that, you know, it doesn't work. It's not a mock humility, it's real. It's a real thing. This is uh, Isaiah 66, two, great verse. Let me just read it. Uh, here, uh, the Lord is speaking and he says, you know, heaven's my throne, earth is my footstool. What's the house you could build for me? You know, what's the place of my rest? All these things, my hand is made. And so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look. Wow, okay, who's the one that God's gonna, you know, See, and the approves of. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Wow, that's poor in spirit. Another way maybe to describe that. 
Uh, you know, remember the, the parable Jesus gave about the tax collector and the Pharisee and how the Pharisee was standing on one corner and says, you know, you know, he thank God that, uh, you know, I'm not like that tax collector over there. And the tax collector over there is standing there, says he would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but he just says, you know, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And remember Jesus' comments about that? You know, which one was approved by God? Jesus said, the tax collector was justified before God, not the Pharisee. Uh, the Pharisee is an example of someone who's proud in spirit. That tax collector is an example of someone who is poor in spirit. And he was the one that was approved, not for sure the other one. So, okay. And then point three here, why is poor in spirit listed first? Well, I, I think he probably, you know, put this one first because humility, and really the idea of humility lies actually behind all these, but especially the first one today, and then the, one, the third one where it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, humility lies behind both of those, but each one has kind of a slightly different emphasis, and we'll see that more when we get to that, that third one. But I think humility really is the foundation for all these other virtues and graces. Uh, uh, pride has no place in Christ's kingdom. Nobody in heaven is going to be able to sing that old, uh, this way, way, way before my time, but uh, the old Frank Sinatra song, uh, you know, I did it my way. No, nobody will be singing that in heaven. Um, and until any person is willing really to surrender uh, their spiritual pride, they cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We cannot be filled until we're empty. Um, we cannot begin the Christian life without humility. Remember, Jesus said, unless we become like little children. Uh, remember, little children are, you know, how so totally trusting they are of their parents and totally dependent on their parents. That's the picture here. Completely trusting Christ, completely dependent on him, like little children. You know, and yet sadly, though, there's actually too much, so, you know, or too little talk these days about humility in churches. You don't hear about it so much. Uh, and this great quality, and it's certainly not a, a trait our government likes to display. Uh, you know, but there are books out there on how to be successful. Uh, you know, there's books out there on, on how, to, how to get things from God, you know, because those things cater to our natural selfishness. Um, you know, you do, and, and they sell well. And so, yeah, they write those kinds of books. But, you know, there's very little interest out there on how to, how to be empty. Um, how to uh, deny yourself and take up your cross and follow Christ, wherever he may lead, whatever it might be, whatever. You just don't find much out there on that. So until a person realizes how uh, helpless spiritually he is, how doomed he is, apart from Christ, you know, his own spiritual poverty, he won't look for a redeemer. Who needs a redeemer when you're getting everything you want? My life is good. I got good, you know, finances and good health and, and uh, you know, family, whatever. Who needs a redeemer? You know, I'm doing very well on my own. Thank you very much. And that's pretty much the opposite of being poor in spirit. You know, they, um, because people like that tend to, uh, you know, they don't realize their own spiritual bankruptcy. In fact, it's kind of like what Jesus said in the, uh, to the church in Laodicea. Uh, in chapter 3, verse uh, 17, he says this. Here's this church known, uh, known as the, uh, you know, the lukewarm church. For example, in verse 16, he says, because you're lukewarm. You're not hot. You're not cold. You know, you're just lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It's not a good thing. And then he says, verse 17, for you say, okay, here's what they said of themselves. You say, I'm rich. I've prospered. Uh, I need nothing. And then here's Jesus' opinion of them. He said, you don't realize you are wretched. You're pitiable. You're poor. You're blind and naked. And he goes on, I counsel you to buy from me gold and, you know, clothes and so Anyway, so he, he gives them grace. He said, that can change, you know, repent, come back to me. 
you'll be all right, but as you are now, you say you've got everything you need, you're fine, and he says, no, you're not. In my opinion, in God's opinion, you're pitiable, wretched, yikes. That's a person who's proud in spirit. Or it's like Jesus said in John 15, 5, it's almost like he's saying, you know, you might not, you know, maybe you don't realize this, but apart from me, you can't do anything. And that applies to everything. You know, you don't, you can't take your next breath of air unless he permits it. Uh, apart from him, we can do nothing. So, and, and in another sense too, you know, Christ doesn't really become precious when a person is full of himself. We got a lot of people very full of themselves, proud in spirit. Uh, so humility has to precede everything else. Those who refuse to recognize that they're lost without Christ. Again, this is, you know, apart from Christ. Uh, are they, they're like the blind, there's a story I heard about the uh, blind Roman girl who said, uh, I'm not blind, it's just the world has always been this dark. You know, she didn't realize her situation. So Jesus is, he's saying here that if, um, until the proud in spirit become poor in spirit, uh, they will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Again, wow, let that sink in. This is Jesus saying this. And others might say, no, that's not right. I don't believe that. Well, that's their option. But Jesus said, well, the poor in spirit will inherit heaven. And he's the one that would know and has the authority to back that up. All right, point four on the sheet. It says, how do we gain this poor in spirit? I mean, can you write a book that says, you know, humility and how I attained it? You know, I don't think so. I, I think Roy's written that book. Can you write that real? But anyway, no, you can't, uh, you know, how do you write that? Uh, but, you know, I want to say too that all this, you know, doesn't, it, all this doesn't start with us, okay? Uh, uh, nor does it involve us trying to, you know, put ourselves down, uh, you know, uh, casting yourself down. We're already down. Humility just recognizes that. And nor should we go around acting hopeless or helpless. I mean, God wants us to get us out of that position to feeling blessed. So what I want to say is genuine humility, real humility, is, is a work of God, uh, especially in our salvation. Uh, but having said that, I think I'll just mention a couple things here. From a human point of view, there are several things we can do. One, and these are, are on your sheet there. You know, take your eyes off yourself. Put your eyes on God. Keep them there. Uh, like, uh, uh, like John the Baptist said, you know, I must decrease. He must increase. Because um, as we study his word, when we desire to be near God, uh, that's, uh, that's moving us in the direction of being poor in spirit. Or another, starve that old sinful nature by uh, removing or uh, avoiding the things that will promote pride or spiritual pride. Uh, things like, you know, watch out for seeking popularity, you know, or, or uh, you know, seeking praise. Watch out for that. Be wary of that. Uh, many of you remember Ron Davenport. Uh, I was a retired pastor. He was here for many years, and uh, um, he recently died. And he, um, quite often, after when I'd give a message, he would tell me afterwards, he says, well, I would tell you you did a good job, but I'm not going to because I don't want you to get the big head. And, uh, you know, he said it teasingly, you know, it was in fun. And, uh, but he, there is an element of truth to that. And so, ra but I'd rather err on the side of encouragement. We all, we all need lots of encouragement especially kids, just, you know, give them lots of encouragement. We all need that. Uh, but just uh, be, uh, watch out for seeking positions or seeking praise, you know, or fishing for compliments just to stroke your pride. And then uh, one more, uh, ask God for this. I mean, it's a gift of God, pray for it. Uh, uh, true humility really is something that comes from the Lord. And I, I think he's more willing to give it than we are even to receive it. All right. Point five on here, how do we know if we're humble? Well, I think you could just ask a friend, am I humble? And when they get done laughing, they'll probably say, you got a long ways to go, buddy. Um, but uh, I listed some things here that, you know, how do we know if we're humble? Uh, some clues here. Uh, number one, 
Uh, someone who's poor in spirit uh, loses their self-preoccupation with themselves, okay? Um, you know, like Paul said, uh, for me, you know, to die is gain, to live is Christ. His focus is on Christ. Uh, we become wonder in the lost of Christ and who he is and what he's done, not in ourselves, okay? Second, we won't complain, and this one is a tough one, and, but it's so important. We won't complain about our situation no matter how bad it gets. You know, Paul, when he in Philippi, he uh, was you know, beat up and, and uh, whipped and then thrown in jail. And, uh, you know, he, he didn't want to be in jail. Of course, he wasn't in, you know, and it says, what was he doing? You know, at midnight, he and Silas were singing hymns, hymns of praise. Well, it wasn't, you know, I'm so happy I'm here in jail. I mean, that would be weird. But he's just, he, he's blessed. He, he has this tremendous hope in what lies ahead. And so he's singing songs of praise in jail, and yet he's in jail unfairly. Uh, he's just been basically tortured. He's in a lot of pain. Uh, and he's in there, um, you know, some, by someone, you know, purposely put him in. You know, sometimes if things happen to us, they go, sorry, you know, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do that. Well, they didn't say that. They were saying, no, we intentionally wanted to make your life miserable. And, and yet he still didn't complain. And he was singing hymns of praise to God at midnight. By the way, I probably should say, I don't, rec if you're married, I don't recommend you probably doing that waking up at midnight and belting out a song of praise, you know, it sounds real spiritual, but your spouse probably won't like it so much. Uh, but anyway, you know, here he is singing hymns of praise uh, at midnight in jail. So even though all these bad things were happening to him, and they were bad, uh, he wasn't complaining. That's, that's amazing. You know, maybe another way to say the same thing is, is that someone who's poor in spirit does not expect better treatment than what Jesus got. Sometimes we think we do, we don't. In fact, Jesus warned us about that very thing in John 15. I wonder if we have that on the verse, I think. John 15, 20. Yeah, remember the word that I said to you here. This is right near the end of his life, right before his crucifixion. A servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll also keep yours. So. Don't expect better treatment than he got, and he got lied about and slandered continuously. Um, uh, someone poor in spirit won't expect better treatment. Three, we'll clearly see that, you know, we seek to see the strengths and good points of others, okay? Instead of trying to put them down. And, and as Romans 12, 10 says, we will give uh, in humility preference to one another in honor. Rather than trying, you know, look at me, as we try to lift up others and let them be honored. Uh, we'll spend more time in, in, much time in prayer. We'll be asking and seeking and knocking, uh, you know, in prayer because we're, we're always needy. We're always in need. We always need the Lord. Hopefully we'll pray even like Jacob did when he, you know, all night wrestled with that angel and he wouldn't let him go. He didn't quit until the angel blessed him to pray like that. Uh, fifth, we'll take Christ on his terms, not on our terms. Besides, uh, Christ won't let us into his kingdom on our terms. We don't get to set the terms. A lot of people want to set the terms. They go, well, I don't like that. I think I'll get in this way. No, there's no other way. Jesus said, I am the way, and the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father. No one gets to heaven except through me. And so that way is open to all, though. Anyone can come that way, but that's the one way to come. The road is narrow. So, but that's why, uh, again, uh, uh, you know, the Word of God needs to be our guide, not our own personal opinions. Uh, and uh, the person who is uh, poor in spirit will realize that uh, he or she, has, you have no bargaining power with God. No, he sets the terms. Uh, the only thing we can ask for is mercy, mercy. Uh, that's another sign kind of someone who's poor in spirit. Or another one, it means uh, an absence of defensiveness. <clears throat> so many people today are so, so defensive. And there are many reasons for that, but part of it, it comes, they're you know, just so insecure. They're so emotionally fragile that they cannot take any criticism, even from a friend. They just can't handle that. And they fall apart, or they get depressed, or they go in a rage, or they go, oh yeah, well, well you're a lot worse than me, or so defensive. Someone who's poor in spirit is not defensive like that. 
Uh, they won't make excuses for their behavior or rationalizations. They don't have, feel like, you know, I have to explain myself. You know, it's kind of the absence of being judgmental. Someone poor in spirit doesn't point fingers um, or another. Humility causes us to praise and thank God for all his blessings. Really. Uh, uh, a humble person, and this is where the world's definition and idea of humility is so messed up. Uh, they often think, you know, a humble person is someone who goes down with their head down and they're mumbling about how bad they are and how worthless they are and, you know, they don't deserve anything good and, you know, they're moping around and they're, you know, they're acting like a doormat and they just let everybody walk over them. No, that is not humility. And do you know why not? Because, well, think about it. What is that person doing? Uh, they are, again, totally focused on themselves, just in a very negative way. Some are focused on themselves in a positive way. Look at me, you know, I'm awesome. Others are focused on themselves in a very negative way. Oh, I'm no good, I'm terrible, I'm bad. And, and they just go on and on like that, moping. No, that's not humility. You know, the best definition of humility I've ever heard, uh, and, and there's some good ones, but this one I, I really like, um, it says, humility is joyful self-forgetfulness. You, you, you don't even come into the equation. You're focused on Christ. Or you're focused on preferring you know, others in honor. You're not thinking about yourself, whether you're in a great way or in a bad way. Uh, that's why I, uh, you know, nothing, I put this, nothing characterizes a humble person more than a spirit of joyful praise and thanksgiving to God. Really, uh, true biblical humility, okay? True biblical humility is a, is a very attractive, a very positive, a very uh, uh, winsome trait, okay? True biblical humility is a very attractive, positive, and winsome trait. It's a good thing. So, and then he wrap up here. He says, what's the, uh, what's the result then? Someone who has this poor in spirit realizing that apart from Christ, I can do nothing. I'm totally dependent on him. What does Jesus say? He says, those who have this, this kind of spirit who come to the king in humility uh, will inherit his kingdom. Uh, so what's the condition? The condition is being poor in spirit. What's the blessing? You inherit his kingdom. The kingdom where Jesus will reign forever and ever, and you'll get to reign with them, he says. That's amazing. And it's been said that, you know, those who come to Christ with a broken heart, sincerely, don't leave with a broken heart. I think that's true. And, and so let's remember, you know, the kingdom of heaven is simply the greatest possession you can ever get or could ever possibly have. It's that good. So... We have this verse, actually I think we have it on the screen, Isaiah 57, 15. Let's see. Yeah, it says here again, God speaking, for thus says to the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. But I also, here's also where he dwells. Isn't this interesting? I dwell in the high and holy place, but I also dwell with the person who has a contrite and lowly spirit, this poor in spirit to revive the spirit of the lonely and to revive the heart of the contrite. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 6, it says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might at the proper time exalt you. So at the right time. And he gets to pick the time. We don't get to pick the time. But notice that. He says, Humble yourselves in the mighty hand of God so that he might at the right time might exalt you. So are you willing to uh, give up your own little kingdom to inherit his kingdom? Well, it all begins, as Jesus says, with the poor in spirit, both to begin with and it continues. Well, let's, let's close. And again, I encourage you to, let's memorize that verse for next week. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is so much more in this verse that we didn't uh, unpack and more things we could say about this. It's, it's an incredible subject one that our world uh, doesn't get, doesn't understand, and so they continuously uh, uh, distort it and uh, slander it and misunderstand it in various ways. But Lord, uh, help us to get our, our guidance comes from you. And I thank you that 
Uh, this kind of poor in spirit, this, this humility, is actually a very positive, uh, attractive trait. And may, may you continually develop that in our lives. It's easy for us to become proud in spirit and in all kinds of ways. Lord, help us be poor in spirit, realizing we are spiritually, we're totally dependent on you. And that's a good thing. And you said that's a good thing because those people will inherit your kingdom. We want that. And so thank you for this good morning. Help us as we go forth into this new week that we might demonstrate in our attitudes and our relationships with people this kind of joyful self-forgetfulness to lift up others and to encourage others and to point them to you, the one and only Savior. We pray in your name. Please stand for the closing hymn. of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thanks for coming. Have a great day and a great week.
Hearts unfold like flowers before the opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light.